Yeah. So let's have some examples of enzyme inhibition coming into the actual drug interactions. As you see on the slide, macrolide antibiotics like erythromycin and clarithromycin are likely to inhibit the metabolism or breakdown of warfarin, which is an oral anticoagulant. So its level will increase in the blood and this can amount to bleeding. The second example, a classical example, is an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, fluoxetine. This can inhibit the metabolism of terfenidine, astimizole, and cesapride. And these drugs are likely to precipitate cardiac arrhythmia. The third example, a very good and useful example, is ritonavir, an antiretroviral agent. This antiretroviral agent inhibits the metabolism of other anti-HIV drugs and increases their blood level, which is useful in the management of HIV AIDS. Now we move on to non-microsomal enzyme inhibition and that's a very classical example of acetaldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor called disulfiram, which inhibits the breakdown of acetaldehyde if the patient has consumed alcohol and acetaldehyde accumulates inside the body and patient gets a very severe reaction called alcohol intolerance. We are trying to attach in the form of diacelpiram an aversive stimulus to the alcohol intake and we try to use diacelpiram by this mechanism for management of alcohol addiction. There are many other drugs who also produce diacelpiram like effect and it will be worthwhile to remember the names that's metronidazole, cephalosporins, chlorpropamide, macrolids, H2 blockers, trimethoprim and sulfur drugs. It's good to have one example of toxic metabolism and it's about acetaminophen, that's your paracetamol. As long as you're giving paracetamol in normal doses, it's fine. It gets converted into harmless gluconoid and sulfate metabolites. But if you start giving acetaminophen in a large dose, especially in children, then due to this overdose, the metabolic pathways, the normal metabolic pathways get exhausted and the drug starts following another alternative metabolic pathway due to which a reactive toxic metabolite is formed which is called N-acetyl P-benzoquinone amine N-acetyl P-benzoquinone amine which many people abbreviate as N-A-B-Q-I that's n acetyl p benzoquinone amine This substance reacts with the essential haptic cell proteins and produces cell death and haptic damage. The drug of choice for acid aminophen overdose is n acetyl cysteine, which donates the self hydrogen. At the end of metabolism, now we are moving on to understand what's pharmacodynamics. There are basically five principles of drug action by which a drug may act. Stimulation, depression of the cell or a system, irritation, replacement and cytotoxic action. Going to the detailed mechanisms of action, the drugs may act by physical properties, by chemical properties or the drugs may act on target molecules. Let's have an example of drugs acting by physical properties. We have a bulk laxative, that's fiber, forms bulk, it's a physical property of a drug. Or magnesium sulfate acting in the form of an osmotic laxative. Or for that matter, activated charcoal which adsorbs the alkaloids. And mannitol, the osmotic diuretic. All these are examples of drugs acting by physical properties. Drugs acting by chemical properties, we have antacids which neutralize the gastric hydrochloric acid is a chemical reaction or potassium permanganate producing oxidizing action or this very oxamine chelating the iron or British anti-levicide BAL chelating arsenic. So chelation is also a chemical reaction. Drugs act on target molecules and the various target molecules the drugs can use are the ion channels, the transporters, the enzymes and the receptors. Ion channels most importantly include the L-type calcium channels in the cardiovascular system 
on which nifedipine acts. The T-type calcium channels in the central nervous system are acted upon by ethosuximide, the drug used for absence seizure. Amiodarone, a class 3 antiarrhythmic agent, acts on the outward potassium current. So these are examples of the ion channels. Coming to the transporters, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the antidepressants, act on the reuptake mechanism of serotonin, tricyclic antidepressants, act on the reuptake of norepinephrine and serotonin and furosemide acting as a diuretic acts on sodium potassium chloride transporter. So these are the examples of drugs acting on transporters. Now we go to the enzymes and receptors in details. Many drugs practice enzyme inhibition and it could be competitive inhibition which could be equilibrium or non-equilibrium. Equilibrium competitive enzyme inhibition is done by various drugs. Physostigmine inhibits the enzyme cholinesterase. Captopril inhibits angiotensin converting enzyme. Finasteride inhibits 5 alpha reductase. And carbidopa inhibits dopa decarboxylase. Non equilibrium enzyme inhibition is a bit different. The drug acts on the same site but produces a covalent bonding and this bonding is more firm and more difficult to reverse. For example, organophosphorus compounds, organophosphates combined with the enzyme choline esterase at an esteritic site producing a covalent band bonding. Enzyme inhibition which could be non-competitive in which the drug does not act on the same site, it acts on an adjacent site which is not a cat catalytic site and it leads to alteration in the enzyme structure leading to loss of the catalytic property of the enzyme. We have various good examples of non-competitive enzyme inhibition. We have astazolamide which inhibits carbonic anhydrase, aspirin inhibits cyclooxygenase, disulfiram aldehyde dehydrogenase or acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, Omeprazole inhibiting the hydrogen potassium ATPase and the joxin in the heart inhibiting sodium potassium ATPase. Statins used for hyperlipidemia inhibit HMG-CoA reductase enzyme. Now we go on to the last part of the target molecules and that's receptors. There are four important types of receptors on which the drugs can act. G protein coupled receptor, intrinsic ion channel receptor, enzyme linked receptor, or an intracellular receptor. G protein coupled receptors are the most important receptors which work by adenylyl cyclase cyclic AMP system. Examples are beta 1 receptors, alpha 2 receptor, and H2 receptor. Phospholipase C and inositol phosphate 3 and diacylglycerol system exist for alpha 1 and H1 receptors and the calcium and potassium channels in the heart are the examples of channel regulation by G protein coupled receptors. Intrinsic ion channels exist for nicotinic receptor which has a sodium channel and GABA A receptor, GABA A receptor which has chloride ion channel. Enzyme linked receptors could be intrinsic enzyme or Janus kinase, stat kinase type of enzyme. Intrinsic enzyme is insulin receptor having tyrosine kinase enzyme and Jack stat kinase enzyme is acted upon by cytokines and interferons. When we talk of a receptor, it's going to receive. So most of the times we feel it should be on the surface of the cell membrane. It should be on the cell membrane. There are some interesting receptors which are inside the cells which are called intracellular receptors and they work by gene transcription. They may be present in the cytoplasm as in case of steroids and vitamin D or may be present in the nucleus then we call it a nuclear receptor in case of androgen, estrogen, thyroxine and vitamin A. Since we started talking about receptors we need to know two important terms. One is called affinity 
And the second one is called intrinsic activity. What's affinity? Affinity is the capacity of a drug to combine with a receptor. Whereas intrinsic activity, which is also called efficacy, is the capacity of a drug to initiate action after combining with a receptor. Affinity is capacity to combine. Intrinsic activity is capacity to initiate the action. Based on the affinity and intrinsic activity, we can have four types of drugs interacting with a receptor. The first one is agonist, what sometimes you call stimulant, has got affinity as well as intrinsic activity. So it combines with the receptor and initiates action. And the intrinsic activity is 100%, so it's said to be one. Antagonist does combine with the receptor, has got affinity, but its intrinsic activity is very poor, so it's called zero. Partial agonist has got affinity, which is same as that of agonist, and it also does have intrinsic activity, but this intrinsic activity is less than agonist, so we take it as between zero and one. And the last one is an inverse agonist, which does have affinity, and its intrinsic activity is negative. Now, we'll understand very important issues about the dose-response relationship. What we are going to do is, we're going to plot the dose on the x-axis and the response on the y-axis. The dose on the x-axis and the response on the y-axis. If you start giving a drug to a tissue and the drug starts producing a response at this stage, you get this kind of a curve which you call as dose response curve. The position of the curve on this particular graph is going to decide what's the absolute amount of drug required to produce a response, to produce an effect and that's called as potency. If this particular curve is placed more on the right side, it means this drug is requiring more dose to produce the effect and then we say this drug is less potent and this one is more potent. The second property of this particular curve is the height of the curve and the height of the curve is speaking about was the response. So if a drug is producing a higher maximal response, we say this drug has got more intrinsic activity, which is also called efficacy. So maximal response matches the intrinsic activity or efficacy. If you look at these two drugs now, suppose we name this A and name this B. A is a drug which is producing a higher maximal response. So we say A is more efficacious drug or A has got more intrinsic activity. So that's about potency and the intrinsic activity of a drug. Have a look at the slide. I've written on the top, compare drugs A, B and C. And they have got various potencies and intrinsic activities. What you can do is you can use this particular slide for your own self-study to work on which drug is more potent, which drug is more efficacious. The third most important issue is the slope of the curve. That's another property of a curve. Just to make it easy, just to make it simple, what am I going to do is, I'm going to make it a straight line, a log dose response curve. Look at this particular curve. And this is drug A. Suppose I draw another graph for another curve, a log dose response curve. And this is that another drug. And I call it B. If you compare between A and B, A has got comparatively steep slope. I put the word steep. Now it should be red. It's a steep slope. As compared to drug A, the drug B has got a flat type of a curve. 
What does it signify? It means when I start increasing the dose of drug B, the response is gradually increasing. Whereas if you go to drug A, after a certain limit, for example here, the curve is straight will becoming steep and the response is suddenly increasing. It means for drug A, if you increase the dose by smaller increments, you are going to get a sudden abrupt response, which means drug A is not a safe drug for your patient. Such drugs which have got a steep dose response curve are likely to have less therapeutic index or less margin of safety. Whereas a drug which produces a flat dose response curve is likely to be a safer drug. Now we start discussing about what is selectivity of a drug. Many times we use a term, this particular drug is a cardio-selective beta blocker, say beta-1 selective blocker. Or sometimes we say it's a selective beta-2 stimulant. What's this selectivity? Suppose a drug has got the capacity to produce two different effects at two different doses. So the dose response curve for these two effects will be different. If the two curves are not much apart, they are together, it means the two effects are overlapping each other. And at near about same doses, the drug is producing the two effects. Then the drug is not selective. If you give a drug in a particular dose, it's going to get both the responses. Whereas if the two curves are quite apart, it means the drug has got selectivity. You can have a look at the slide that salbutamol, a selective beta-2 stimulant. The first curve is the dose response curve for bronchodilation, whereas the second curve is the curve for cardiac stimulation. And you can obviously see that there is wide margin between the two curves. The two curves are quite apart, which means you can give salbutamol, get bronchodilation, but there will be minimal cardiac stimulation. The second example is of isoprenaline. And if you look at these two curves, the curve for bronchodilation and cardiac stimulation are not quite apart. They are much together, which means the two effects are overlapping. And isoprenaline, while producing bronchodilation, can also produce cardiac stimulation. So we say isoprenaline is less selective and salbutamol is more selective drug. Now, we can also draw two different dose response curves for the same drug. One curve for the therapeutic effect and another curve for the adverse effect. If the drug has these two curves far apart from each other, it means there is a wide margin of safety between the therapeutic effects and the adverse effects of the drugs. And such drugs are likely to have a large therapeutic index and they are going to have the safety of margin. Whereas those drugs for whom the DRC of the therapeutic effect and the DRC of the adverse effect are quite close to each other, these drugs are going to have a narrow margin of safety, less margin of safety. We now come to the receptor regulation. What's down regulation and up regulation of receptors? After all, receptor is a substance. When you start using an agonist over a long period of time, this agonist is going to use this substance, the receptor substance. And when the agonist keeps on using the receptor substance, the number of receptors go on decreasing. And because it decreases, it's called down regulation of receptors. And this is why when you use an agonist for a pretty long period of time, you are likely to get a gradual decrease in the response. This happens due to decreased synthesis or more destruction of the receptor. Whereas the opposite phenomena can happen for upregulation of receptors. And this happens most probably with the antagonist. When you use an antagonist, the antagonist is going to sit on the receptor, is going to block the receptor, but is not going to use the receptor substance. And because it's not using the receptor substance, if you use an antagonist for a pretty long period of time, slowly, gradually, there's going to be increase in the number of receptors. So we call it upregulation of receptors. What can happen? You have given an antagonist for a long period of time, 
and there's upregulation of receptor, there's increase in the receptor number. If you suddenly stop this antagonist, what's going to happen is the super sensitivity of the receptor and a sudden abrupt increase in the response. This classically can happen if someone is consuming beta blockers for a long period of time and these beta blockers are suddenly stopped, it can lead to an exaggerated response due to the super sensitivity and can lead to angina on abrupt stoppage of the beta blockers. When we give two drugs together, either these two drugs can go hand in hand and work together, what you call a synergism, or the two drugs can antagonize each other, what is called antagonism. Synergism has two types of additions. The first one is called additive effect, when there is arithmetic addition of the individual effects of the drug. So the effect of AB, the combination, is going to be the arithmetic addition of effect of A and effect of B. Whereas true drug synergism happens when you are using a combination and the effect of the combination is much more than the arithmetic addition of the effect of A and effect of B. It's like saying 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Could it happen? Yes, it could happen in practice when the two drugs produce drug synergism. The next important thing which can happen is two drugs oppose each other and that's called drug antagonism which can be of various types that's physiological, physical, chemical and pharmacological. We shall be doing the details of the drug antagonism also. First, the additive effect. That's the arithmetic addition. And we've got some examples like you give aspirin and paracetamol together is going to add to the analgesic effects. So it's an additive effect. Or giving diazepam and diphenhydramine. Both of them are CNS depressants. So there will be additive CNS toxicity or additive CNS depression. Or you give alcohol and diazepam together. Again, both are central nervous system depressants and there is going to be additive CNS toxicity. As far as the example of synergism is concerned, which is also called super additive, there is more than the arithmetic addition. We have an example of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole prepared in the form of a combination cotrimoxazole. What is the synergism? What is the 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 in this? It is like trimethoprim given individually works as a bacteriostatic agent. Sulfamethoxazole used individually also works as bacteriostatic agent. But if you combine them in a perfect ratio, then this combination starts becoming a bactericidal combination. So two drugs are individually static, but when they are used in combination, the combination becomes bactericidal. That's an example for drug synergism. Now we move on to understand what's drug antagonism. Two drugs oppose the effects of each other. They can do it by various mechanisms. If the two drugs are acting on the same receptor, it's a receptor antagonism or pharmacological antagonism. If the two drugs are not concerned with the receptors of each other, it's non-receptor antagonism or non-pharmacological antagonism. Let's come to the receptor antagonism first. And we're calling it pharmacological antagonism. This pharmacological antagonism can be due to a competition between the two drugs for the same receptor sites. The two drugs act on the same receptor, they act on the same site, one drug works as agonist and the second one is antagonist, so we call it competition or competitive antagonism. We have a classical example of diazepam and flumazenil acting as a pair of agonist and antagonist at the GABA A receptor. Or we have morphine and agonist at opioid receptors and naloxone competitive antagonist at all the opioid receptors. Uh, what I want you to do is have a look at this particular slide. What's happening? I have shown here a receptor and antagonist coming and sitting on the receptor and trying to prevent an agonist from acting. So let's see what happens. So that's the antagonist receptor complex. Now if you add an agonist is coming but the antagonist 
is already blocking, occupying the receptor. See this. Yeah. And this is how it's denied. That's the competition for the same receptor, for the same site, is called competitive antagonism. Now, if I want to displace this particular antagonist and produce an effect as an agonist, what I need to do is keep on aiding the agonist in larger and larger doses. And when I reach an optimum level of the agonist, the agonist is able to displace some amount of antagonist and it will have few receptor number for its occupation and it will start producing its own effect. This is how the antagonist can be displaced. That is the most important criterion of the competitive antagonism. Now, if you go on adding the dose of agonist, you can get more and more response and at a certain stage, you can fully displace the antagonist to obtain a maximal possible response. Look at the curve. The first curve is agonist alone and the second curve is agonist added in presence of antagonist. What happened is, when antagonist was already there, agonist could not produce a response. You had to add the agonist in larger dose and this is why the curve got shifted to the right. But still, when you added the agonist in larger and larger concentrations, it could obtain its maximal possible response. This is how you can overcome the antagonism by the antagonist. Hence, it's called surmountable or reversible type of antagonism. The second type of antagonism is non-competitive antagonism. It's a pharmacological antagonism happening at the same receptor, but the receptor site could be different. The antagonist combines with a different site on the same receptor, which is an allosteric site. Examples are norepinephrine, the agonist, and alpha blocker phenoxybenzamine, or diazepam and bicuculin are the examples of non-competitive antagonism. Let's have a look at the picture. In the first place, you can see that the receptor site for agonist is different and the site for antagonist is different. Antagonist is combining on the same receptor but at a different site which is called allosteric site. So let's see. Antagonist is coming, blocking the receptor. It's an allosteric site. It's not the true site where the agonist is supposed to act. And when the agonist starts coming, look at what's happening. The antagonist is changing the shape, changing the structure of the original site where the agonist is supposed to combine. And when the agonist tries to come and combine, it finds that the receptor site is changed, the structure is changed and naturally it is denied. I can give you a beautiful example. It's like someone entering from the back door and pulling your chair and not allowing you to sit. That's called non-competitive antagonism. The antagonist combines at a different site but on the same receptor. Looking at the graph, the first curve is agonist alone and the second curve is agonist in presence of antagonist. Here the agonist is able to overcome this antagonism but it can never reach its maximal height. It can never produce the maximal response. And this is why it's called non-surmountable or irreversible type of antagonism. So this was regarding the receptor antagonism or pharmacological antagonism. Now we try to see what's non-receptor antagonism. Two drugs produce opposite effects, but they are not combining at the same receptor. This can be by various mechanisms. The first one is called physiological antagonism. Physiology is a study of organs, system, tissues. So if the two drugs have got opposite effect, on the same system, they don't interfere with the receptors for each other. It's called physiological antagonism. Example is epinephrine, which is going to produce bronchodilation, which is going to raise the blood pressure, where a histamine is going to decrease the blood pressure and is going to produce bronchospasm. In no way, their actions are related to the receptors 
of each other. They just act on one physiological system and produce opposite effects. So we call it physiological antagonism. The second mechanism is purely chemical. And when the two drugs have got opposite chemical properties and they oppose each other, it's called the chemical antagonism. Acid alkali is an example of chemical antagonism. Chelation is an example of chemical antagonism. The third one is called physical antagonism, wherein the two drugs have got a physical reaction. For example, an alkaloid is present in the stomach and you add a universal antidote to the stomach. The universal antidote is going to produce adsorption of the alkaloid which is present in the stomach and is going to hold it and is going to prevent it from getting absorbed. So it is called adsorption. This one being a physical phenomenon is called as physical antagonism. This way, we come to the end of the various pharmacodynamic factors. Thank you very much. I am sure it is going to benefit you. Best of luck.